My name is Rima Angelique, and this is my story. When I was young, I didn't know what normal was. You know, my parents, they divorced when I was in fourth grade, but my mom would always come to me and confide in me and let me know, like, she's going to leave my dad. There were many times when she would call my name and just... Just remember her voice yelling out my name, calling to me um, to rescue her when my dad would be on top of her, um, holding her down naked, and she would just call for me, and I felt helpless, like there wasn't much I could do. And um, when she finally left my dad, after talking about it for so long, she came and picked me up from school with only a suitcase, and she picked up me and my brother and we were off. We went to live at a battered women's shelter. Um, at that shelter, life was completely different than what I knew. You know, I never knew normal, but I never knew something like that. We got a babysitter that lived across the hall from us and she was a mom of two boys that were the same age as me. And she would take us out into a field downtown where I lived and she would go do drugs and tell us to go play as she did drugs with her daughter and I remember we'd go out there and throw around broken bottles and just have a good time and she would be there. My mom found out and she wasn't okay with that. That was the first time I was ever exposed to drugs and you know they were there because their dad ran them over with a car or tried to run them over with a car and it was like I had seen these different aspects of life that I never really saw before you know I didn't know normal but I also wasn't in, involved in things like that, and so I knew, I remember feeling fortunate. We got a new babysitter after that. She moved in. She was actually our roommate, because at that place we would get roommates. And um, she ended up being not healthy. Um, she was 16 years old, and she would try to play games in the dark with me and my brother, where um, he, she would try to get my brother or me to touch her in the dark, and she put up our beds next to each other, me and hers, and um, I remember my mom did did protect me. She found out about that and she made clear boundaries with that girl. Um, but that was the first time I actually started to be around that kind of thing. I wasn't really sure what that meant or what that was, but we soon moved out and as time went on, things moved fast after that. Um, my mom and my mom and dad did not get back together. Um, but I saw my dad a few times. He would come around and I remember when I was in um, like fifth grade around uh, He's you know, he sat me down in a swimming pool and um, He described to me some things About my mom And at the time I didn't understand what it meant um, but he told me what an abortion was and um, he let me know that that's what my mom has done before and he let me know things about her and just things that I as a young child didn't understand and didn't need to understand and um, in a way trying to make me hate her and um, he tried to get back with my mom and she didn't want him and my mom quickly went into other relationships and she got a boyfriend and they were short-lived and then she started talking to this guy on the phone and this guy's name was white trash and she would giggle and laugh with him on the phone all day long and i just she told me he was a friend but i knew there was something more going on with that i knew the way she was with with him i, I just knew and i remember i guess i was kind of troubled at this time and i didn't realize it but looking back i was and i drew a picture of a woman flicking off the camera and I gave it to my mom and I said, give this to White Trash. And she gave it to him and he said to her, I know she's not going to like me. Um, fast forward maybe a few weeks later and I'm the only fifth grader that makes it into the middle school spelling bee. And I was going to a really nice school, really nice area. We were living in a really nice house because my mom had a really well-paying, respectable job. And um, so... I actually won the spelling bee, but that's <laughs> beside the point. The night before the spelling bee, I was studying for it. And 
we get a knock at the door and it's a man with a scruffy beard and a beanie and my mom says to us this is the shower repair man he's gonna just fix the shower so they go into her room and they close the door and that's that i don't think too much of it because i'm invested in the spelling bee studying well a few days go by and white trash is gonna come over for the first time my mom starts to cook dinner, which was weird because she's not wasn't much of a cook. He knocks on the door, and um, it's a man with a wife beater and and big sweatpants and tennis shoes and scruffy beard. And I'm like, he looks familiar. Yeah, well, he happens to be the shower repair man. The shower wasn't really broken, and um. I remember just knowing that he was going to move into our lives fast because he slept on the couch that night and he introduced us to his daughters. One of his daughters moved in and the other few, um, the other two lived with their mom and then he had a son in West Virginia and things went fast. He moved in within a few days. Um, he took dominance. He let us know he was f a felon. He doesn't play around. He made strict rules already. And one of the first acts of dominance was he walked in because my mom gave him keys right away while my baby while my babysitter was there. And he started yelling and cussing and acting a fool and saying that she treated us wrong and he was there for us and he was going to essentially save us from this evil crazy babysitter and so my mom quickly fired her because it was his orders and he showed us about himself he told us this, some stories and he took off his shirt and he showed me his tattoos he had a big tattoo on his stomach that said white trash and it was a big trailer and a burning barrel and um a big dragonfly tattoo and um, a statement that says property of God Almighty on his chest and just a demon on his arm and just some very intense imagery of who he is and what he believes and um, one of the first things he did was he said Rima you want to watch me fight and I said oh, oh yeah sure and he said yeah, oh boy over here was treating your mama wrong. He flicked her off. That means he wants to get with her. And so he took us all. He rounded us all up in the car. His daughter that moved in with us, me, my brother, and my mom. And he went to let us watch the fight. Um, he walked up to this guy and it was he went up to some drug house. We had to drive like 40 minutes to get there uh, because it was from his side of town, which was, happened to be far from this nice area we're living in. And he walks up to the guy, he just slaps him in the face without him even noticing. They start rolling around, his daughter's beside me in the car, and she's like, Daddy, Daddy! And she's screaming and crying, and they're fighting, and um, when the fight is over, he, my stepdad, runs, or he's white trash at this time, he's not my stepdad, yet. Um, he runs over to the guy's car. And he puts his hand in his face and points at him. The guy takes out a knife and slices his tendons. Like all of his tendons except for one. So his hand is literally hanging on by a thread. Literally. And he runs to the car. He's like, gosh. I mean, he's... His blood is just flowing out of him. And he gets into the car and he says... We have to go to the hospital, and my mom took him to the hospital. We were there. Um, yeah, like, he almost literally lost his hand because of that. And um, around this time, things start picking up, and my stepdad is telling us our number one rule, and he's learned this from prison, is no snitching. So if we are found to be a snitch, we will get worse punishment than the, snit than the person we're snitching on. So I think it was either me or my... or his daughter that had snitched on my brother um, because he left a door open to the outside and so we all had to stay in the corner 
um, only except the people that snitched stayed in the corner longer. So that was his first act of dominance. That was one of his first, like, really big acts of dominance. We're only a few weeks into knowing this guy, and he's already taking over. And so things progressively pick up, and he tells my mom that we need to move to his side of town. And so that's what we did. We moved to his side of town. And um, at this time, I'm still in touch with my dad, very on and off, but very still in touch. And he calls me out. So we had a big porch and he would have night talks on there. And he would talk to us about all things like prison and, you know, he would talk about God. I had never been to church, so I didn't really know anything about God, but he kind of just brought it up to me. I'm, I'm like, not really sure, but he tells me about his own, you know, God. And then my mom lets me know, like, he's actually a mind reader and all these things that I've never heard of before. But apparently my stepdad was, or apparently White Trash was a mind reader. And um, so don't ever think of anything bad around him because he'll know. And um, I remember my dad came around and my stepdad called me out of the house and he said to me Rima we we have something to tell you and and I I, I don't want to hurt your feelings but I just want to let you know what happened and he said when your parents your mom and dad got divorced your dad gave your mom the paperwork and he said no matter what happens you're the one with the raw end of the deal because you're the one that stuck with the effers and um he, I remember that feeling of the first time feeling unwanted and like I wasn't good enough. Um, and, and so he, he let me know like he could be my dad now and um, that no, no worries about that because he's my father now. There's nothing to worry about. He's got me. And um, I just remember that feeling in the pit of my chest of like emptiness, like just that you can't breathe, that chest tightness. And um, my dad came around a few times. Uh, he picked up my brother to do some things. And I just remember he, he didn't take me. He just brought, he just took my brother. And, um, and I, I remember that feeling of looking out the window and as my dad's eyes meet mine and, um, and, and, and he just drives away. And I, I think that right there is something that I still remember. There's a lot of things from my childhood that I do not remember. That's something that I will always remember is that feeling. Um, so my stepdad told us that we need to call our dad and let him know he's no longer our dad. And so he made my brother call my dad. White Trash is on the other end of the phone and he's whispering in my brother's ear telling him what to say to my dad. He says, you're no longer our dad. We have a dad now. It's done. And my dad says, okay. And my dad leaves and he doesn't come back. That's all it took. And um, it's just a lot of confusion. It was a lot of what's going on. Life was weird back then. Life wasn't normal growing up. It was nothing like this. And so he makes very strict, strict rules. If we do not conform, we're in trouble. He told us there were security cameras all over the house. He said he kept them in the bathrooms, in the basement, um, in all areas. And he said that he would have a close watch on everything that we would do. He would make very, he would check the crumbs on the counter to see if we had done our, our chores. I remember he would take sunflower seeds and he would plant them in hidden areas around the kitchen to make sure that we were cleaning everything spotlessly. If we didn't do every little thing the way he said to do it, he would wake us up screaming um, in our face, spitting in our face. Like I, I remember I got to a point where he thought my brother was being disobedient to him because my brother, he felt like my brother wasn't bowing down to him the way he should have. And so he would make my brother run about three miles a day 
and he would say, and he would whoop him with a switch. He would go get a switch off the tree, and he even would threaten him with the with the switches with thorns on them. And I, and he would take him in the room if he didn't finish his, if he didn't do what he was supposed to do, if he didn't finish his laps in time, because we had to sit out there and time him every lap. And if it wasn't done in a certain amount of time, he would take the switch, he would take him to the room, and he would brutally. brutally 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 abuse him and as an older sister like like those moments because I was two years older than him it's like those moments of feeling helpless because I love him and he's all I had and I just hear the screams And around this time, I'm kind of wondering what is the point of life? You know, I'm getting older. It gets to a point in my house where my stepdad tells my mom, you know, it's either me or your son. And my mom chose him, my stepdad, because by this time they got married. And um, he makes my brother at the age of 10 move out into the shed. Before that, he says, if you want to be a real man, you're going to tough it out like a real man. And he bought boxing gloves and he would just, he would go out in the yard and made my brother, he would just, he beat my brother up. And, um, and he would also bring in teenage boys to live with us that would bang my brother's head into the concrete of the floor and hump his face. And my stepdad, um, taught him how to masturbate and, um, sexually he would definitely sexually abuse him but he would bring in boys that would do that to them to him and um they would teach us about sex and they would teach us and my stepdad showed me porn and he would let us he would tell us about um all the things he does to my mom in the bedroom and they would go into the bedroom and we'd hear it and he would purposely like he would come out of the room and they would show us their sex toys and all these just disgusting things and um he would lock my brother out of the house and um he would make us eat food in the window and i remember um sneaking my brother out some water and and chips and he my stepdad very specifically said if you guys let him inside you're going to be in huge trouble my mom gets home and can't believe he's still outside because he went my stepdad was on heroin and all these other drugs and he went to sleep all day after that and so by the time my mom got home my mom found out and she was upset about that and um I got screamed at and and whooped and um because I didn't let my brother inside but I was told that if I if I let him in I would be in so much trouble my stepdad said he never said that and um, they made me write an apology letter to my brother. <laughs> like it was, like it was my fault. And um, they made him move out into the shed when he was 10. And they, they, um, they gave him 60 bucks. And they said, if you need anything, you go get it. And um, he had to walk across the highway, the busy highway to go get a Wendy's burger for dinner. And um, I remember around this time, like a lot more happened, a lot of just things like that, but I can't get into all of it because we'd be here all night. But around this time, I'm wondering what the point of life is because I don't know what the point of life is and my stepdad's told me about God and he said he's the anointed one and the Bible says that he's allowed to abuse us and um, that spare the rod, spoil the child and he doesn't want to have to do this but you know he has to but he, he's, he, he's sorry that he has to do this but you know it's just something he has to do and um, I remember I started to cut myself and I would get a knife. I would I loved M&M back then and um 
at this house there was a field beside my house and I'm gonna show you guys what the house looked like here in the field and I sat on the on a tree stump in that field and I remember feeling so depressed and suicidal at this time. And I remember I would cut myself to feel better. I was really the class clown in school, so I would be there making everybody laugh by day. And then when I would get home, I felt so empty and depressed and like there was no point in my life. And I, and I remember wondering, what is the unforgivable sin? Because if it's not suicide, then I want to end my life. So I'm sitting out in the field one night, one day, and um, I'm just talking, I, t I just like start praying, and I'm like, God, I don't know if you're even there, or you're listening, I don't know who you are, um, but I, I do know that I feel depressed, I feel alone, and I feel so broken. And I'm starting to feel this feeling that I've never felt before. And I feel empty. And I just want to know like that you're listening to me. And um, it starts pouring rain. That second that I asked that, are you listening? It just starts pouring rain. And it was a cloudless day. And um, I remember that feeling of, like, I might make it out of this. Like, And as time went on, I still um, started to try to devise a plan to kill myself because I had that experience, but I still was so lost. And um, I went into the bathroom, and I remember just opening up the Bible and asking, like, what is the unforgivable sin? I remember getting no answers, and I actually fell asleep on the bathroom floor. And um, I just remember there was many, a few times I just fell asleep there. And that's the only place I could feel alone and like safe. And um, as I told you earlier, my mom had a well-respected job. She got paid a good amount of money. She wasn't the type of woman to do drugs. And around this time she started doing drugs. And I remember the first time I saw her high, she... She started saying she didn't know who she was. She was like, who are you? Who am I? Are you an alien? I'm an alien. And I remember just being so scared. Like, I, I've i never felt that before. Like, my own mom started slipping away from grasp. It was like, she was there physically. Mentally, she was, there was evil behind her eyes. There was emptiness and evil behind her eyes. It was like, she had a pulse, but that was it. And I remember I confided in her, and I, I went to her, and I said, Mom, um, I think I want to end my life. And uh, she looks back at me, she looks up, and she says, You know, that's all for attention. You don't actually want to, you don't actually feel that way. Get out of here with that. And I remember... She said to me, you have it way better than most. Look at you, you have a roof over your head. A lot of kids don't. You have food. You get whatever you need. You're fine. And I thought, well, maybe I do. Maybe I do have it better than most. Is this how everyone lives? Is life just this bad? And so I just thought, maybe life is just like this. Well, that makes me... Then there's no hope. If this is what life is like, then there, there's no hope that it will get better. And so that just made me even want to just end my life even more. And um, during this time, I started to get demonic attacks at night and I would 
I would be laying in bed and I would feel something on top of me and um, stroking over my body, um, clawing on my body over my covers and it would, um, when I would sit up, it would take my neck and grab me down and um, put me down. And, um, I, and my, my stepsister woke up because we shared a room. And she said that she saw a little girl with long black hair sitting on my bed in the middle of the night around the same time that the stuff started. And when I, and when I, whenever I finally was able to get up, I... It just kept happening it started to keep happening and um i try to find methods of ways to fix this and um i went to this metaphysical new age shop where they gave me crystals and rocks and said that these will protect me keep them under my pillow and i will be protected and safe and to imagine this force field so i'm like 15 years old and i'm being introduced to the new age and they're like this is how you can keep yourself from demons and evil spirits and you just want you just want like spirits that are of the light so make sure that like you're calling on spirits of the light and so this led down this path of of this and um i when i was younger like and when i went to the doctor i had said you know things are happening my mom told the doctor what was happening um uh, because i did hear um voices like i would hear things at night um, that would be in my ear and whisper to me and growl in my ear. Um, and it, they would speak in a different language. It sounded like a sort of tongues language or Latin. I can't, I can't remember what it was. But the doctor said I don't have symptoms at all of some type of mental issue, mental health issue as far as anything other than he thought I was just sensitive to the spiritual realm, which it was weird because I'm sure most doctors would have been like what but this doctor actually knew who I was and had been seeing me for a long time and just knew that it couldn't be the case and also like he knew that the symptoms did not align um and so I started getting into the new age and I remember I would call upon my spirit guides to save me and to help me um and one particular night I actually was on my phone texting someone and was texting a girl and I was um in bed and um, I'm texting and so nobody can say sleep paralysis on this one uh, because I am actively talking to somebody on my phone and something gets on top of me in bed as I'm texting and I start texting random letters my vision goes blank and I start screaming out trying to call on to God whoever God is my stepdad told me never call for any name other than God Almighty. Don't ever use the name of Jesus. That's not what we say in this house. You don't use that name. People that use that name are going to hell. It clearly says in the Bible, you don't praise Jesus. You don't go, you know, so he made up this like whole God of his own imagination, basically. And he had let me know like he knows God. God's spoken to him. God has given him orders. He's going to be one of the last men on earth and he's going to rebuild civilization like a modern day Noah. And he was like, and all my kids are making it to heaven. That's God's already told me that. I have a di uh, direct connection to God. And that was all part of his manipulation scheme. So I ran, when I was finally able to get up, I ran into my parents' room as fast as I could. And um, not my parents, my mom and my stepdad, but I ran into the room as fast as I could. And I'm like, so they try to get inside of me. And my stepdad starts yelling, ain't nothing but God Almighty in this house. Get out. And so I don't get out. I lay there for 10 minutes because I have no breath. I have no, I can't even move at this point. When I finally get up 10 minutes later, um, I feel like all energy and everything has left my body. My knees feel weak and I just feel so horrible. And um, when I'm in, when I'm going back to my room in the hallway, my brother's standing there and he says, Rima, are you okay? And he had never really shown too much empathy because of everything he had been through. Feelings had been beat out of him. He said, come to my room. And he starts praying and praying without ceasing. We weren't really familiarized with prayer and he won't stop praying. And it gets to a point where he says, Rima, 
it's gone. I made it leave. And I was like, what did you just say? What did you just say? And he said, I didn't say anything. What are you talking about? And it was in it like a different voice. And in that moment, he said, Rima, there's an angel in this room. There's an angel in this room. And I just felt this like overwhelming sense of peace. Like I grabbed a Bi our Bible um, and it went to the page. In so it was a prayer in Psalms about um, getting rid of evil. We read that together and I was able to go back into my room and everything felt good. Everything felt clear. And um, just that night was over, but things still continued to happen. I remember one night I was in bed um, and there was like this big thing under my blanket and it ran towards me and then it disappeared. And there was just like a lot of those different things that started to happen. And then after this, um, I started getting deeper, deeper into the new age. I would call on my spirit guides. I would talk to them for consultation or whatever I needed. I would, you know, well, around this time too, um, my mom got way worse and she would, she would very, very badly started to abuse me. She would call me the, I mean, I was called the B word, the F U, F U, F U all the time. I was yelled at F, F U, F U, F U. I wish, um, that I had nothing to do with you. Um, I'm going to go in that room right now and kill myself. That's what my mom would tell me. You know, you've hurt, you know, you've done so much and you're such a bad child that, I'm going to go kill myself. And she, I mean, I remember her telling my brother, I wish you were never born. Um, and after she would say these things, she'd be like, Rima, come here, come here. And she'd be like, come on. And um, I would go to her room and she would um, light up a big bong of smoke of weed. And um, I, she would give it to me to smoke it. And um, after I would smoke it, I would feel like my soul was leaving my body. I would feel, I would see things. I would, I had never seen anything like that. And yeah. You know, um, in my whole past, and I see purple demon, yeah, totally not just weed, um, I'm pretty sure that was laced with some serious stuff, I started hallucinating and seeing all kinds of things, I would lay in bed at night, and I couldn't sleep, um, because there's something like, I would wake up the next morning, and my whole body would be aching and sore. I don't think that's marijuana use, just just like recreational marijuana use. I'm, I'm not gonna. I'm not saying it's the best thing in the world, but I'm not saying that it's gonna do that to you. And so it gets so bad that there was even a time I didn't make all A's, and my mom choked me against the wall, and just a lot of psychological warfare as well. Just like. A lot going on. Well, we moved to another house, and um, I'll show you guys what that was. Now, I wrote a book based on this house. This is Little House on Ansley. There's a lot that happened there, and this is the worst it ever was. All right, so I needed some time to recoup, so we're currently a few days later, and I'm going to get into the rest of the story with you guys. So, now, this time in my life, I started getting into the New Age. If you do not know what the New Age is, the New Age is a spirituality that is basically drawing upon forces in the universe and forces like um, drawing upon chakras and crystals and meditation and talking to your spirit guides and all of these different things and I started to go like onto the roof and I would try to lose myself I would just lay there and I would just like try to you know astral project at night I was trying to lucid dream I was trying to do anything I could to escape reality and sometimes I would do these kind of things and then I would start to see things I would start to like just hallucinate a little bit because when you stare off too long you start to hallucinate and so I was just kind of doing everything that I could and while I think that I'm drawing nearer to truth I'm actually <laughs> furthering myself into this very deep depression um, I started to think more and more about the purpose of life but I would start to I started getting like D's and F's and I started I put like curtains um, and blankets all over my windows and I just laid in the dark all day. I would purposely go in the bathroom every morning and like make myself throw up so I didn't have to go to school. So a lot of times I was skipping school. If I went to school, I'd just sit in my car because I was so depressed like I couldn't go in. And I just remember 
like around this time my mom would continually you know do these things to me that would hurt me and then say come on and come to my room and we would you know smoke together whatever was in that weed but she also gave me antidepressants and so because I told her I was depressed so she just like gave me some medication and I wasn't prescribed to me or anything I just started to do it and that actually would just make me more numb and it would make me not really feel anything and at the time I just realized that like it really wasn't working either and so you know I had went to therapy in the past as well it seemed like nothing was working as hard as I would try nothing was working so my home life just continually got worse my stepdad was on meth and he was a crack dealer there were homeless people living on our couch in our backyard there were drug addicts living in our backyard people doing cocaine on the couch my stepbrother had moved in around this time as well and he was doing drugs and he was getting us um, into that kind of life that he was in as well and so whatever he would do I would kind of be with him while he did it so you know whatever you can name we were doing bad stuff we would go around like, setting things on fire and just doing things that you know kids that are misguided do but um we got into a point where since my stepdad was on meth a lot of crazy things happened that he would accuse us of so one night um he had tried to kill us that day and it was because my mom cheated on him and around that time it was because he cheated on her so she went in turn and cheated on him and so he found out and he chased after us with a gun and he tried to kill us like several times and my mom almost did leave him a few times and she would always go back to him and I just remember that one morning when he beat her with a gun um, around the same time where everything's just getting worse you know he beat her with a gun in the face and she was all bloody and all I hear is her calling my name so I'm upstairs getting ready for school and I just hear that faint scream you know with like a hand on her mouth and she's crying out for me and the moment like that brought me back to those moments in my childhood when she would call for me it was almost like a flashback moment of like always being my mother's keeper always taking care of her and um, those moments will always haunt me the most because if I were to tell on him at like to the police um, I was afraid that my mom would get in trouble and I was so so afraid that um, she would be angry at me because she would hate me if I did this to her husband so I was so lost and I just had to sit up there helplessly and listen to her calling for me and I didn't know what to do and a lot of those different things happened where we would be in those certain situations where we would almost be getting murdered and um, I just felt helpless like I had nowhere to go I had no one to talk to you know the warning signs were there for me but like I didn't have anybody and so I talked a lot about this in my book everything that happened in that house or everything that I can remember because when you've been traumatized like that a lot of things like I'm still remembering to this day and a lot of things I just I simply cannot remember um, because they're just too traumatic and um, so because I would engage in a lot of depersonalization when these things would happen to me I would literally detach myself from my body and not feel anything as a coping mechanism and now I realize that that was okay that I did that um, but I'm kind of just piecing back the story together in my book so let's get to the good parts and the good part is just absolutely incredible and I think that we should take some time to talk about it so one night I am in my bedroom and I am at the end of my rope and I'm kind of like questioning life more than ever before and um I know that there's a god and I kind of thought that my god was this god that allowed you know the new age spirituality and the god of the universe and but you know something that night shifted in me and something that night just made me cry out to god in a way I'd never done before I was not crying out to a God that I had formed in my own mind. I started to cry out to whoever God is. And I I was so sick of looking for truth because every time I searched for truth, I just, I would get deeper in a hole of depression. I mean, look at where I was, you know. None of my truths, none of my cures, none, none of my healing was working. Nothing I tried was working. So that night I said to my, I said out loud, I said, Lord, 
whoever you are, God, I can't do this without you anymore. Whoever you are, God, I don't know who you are, but I want to know who you are. I cannot do this life without you any longer. And so that Bible that my stepdad gave me, I had it. This is it. I took it, and I'd, I'd never read it before, but I took it and I opened it up to Psalm 57. I'm going to read it out loud to you real quick. This is what I said. I was standing on the wall, and I said, Have mercy on me, O God, have mercy on me. For in you my soul takes refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He sends from heaven and saves me, rebuking those who hotly pursue me. God sends his love and his faithfulness. I am in the midst of lions. I lie among ravenous beasts, men whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be all over the earth. They spread a net from my feet. I was bowed down in distress. They dug a pit in my path, but they themselves have fallen into it. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make music. Awake my soul. I stopped there. I said, awake my soul. Awake my soul. And a force greater than any love or peace that transcends all understanding washed over me. It was the love of a father, the love of a parent, the love that I had never received. It was an unconditional love. Washed over me in a way I cannot describe. It put me on the wall in the cross formation. It put two truths into my heart. That Jesus Christ is the Son of God and He came to take away my sins so that I may be forgiven and have eternal life. I'm telling you, in that moment, I fell to my knees and bowed down in utter reverence to a holy God. There were no time for questions. There was no time. I bawled my eyes out. I didn't even know that you could cry tears of joy because I had never felt joy before. I had never felt a happy emotion like that. I had never felt unconditional love. And just I bowed down and said thank you. And I felt the presence of God over me. I felt him in my room with me. I saw this bright white light over me. And I just saw it standing there. I didn't see who it was but I knew the truth, finally. All those years of searching for healing, searching for the truth, and right there, it was in front of me the whole time. The love of a father that I never thought I had, my father was there with me, walking through every fire, and I just didn't know it. It could have saved me so much pain and so much hurt and so much regret if I would have just known that. And it didn't make sense at the time, but now when I look back and in that moment, life started to make sense, my purpose was revealed to me. I finally had love. I finally had somebody that actually really cared about me. And it, after that day, I was never the same person. Life turned from black and white to color. My depression was gone. And you know, I still lived in that house for two years after that. I was 16 at the time. Until 18, I moved out and I went to college. And even in the moments that life didn't get better, I had somebody to walk through them with me and I knew the truth. I knew the truth of, of who God is and what he's created me for. He's created for every breath that I take to praise him and cry out to him. And I went to college and... Um, I didn't get involved into church until about two years after going to college, so I was I was around 19 or 20. And I got a prayer journal, and something told me on my heart to pray for my brother. Well, my brother actually turned into an atheist after this. And so God just put it on my heart to pray for him and pray for him and pray for him without ceasing. And that's what I did. So here's my prayer journal, and on November 16th, 2019, I wrote a prayer for God to please save him. That was the first time I ever truly, truly, truly prayed without ceasing, and I wrote this. That was my first journal entry. 
My last journal entry was March 26, 2021. <laughs> My brother, I got a call. And he got hit by a semi-truck on his motorcycle. And the doctor said, they went to go pick him up. The doctor said that if he didn't land exactly the way that he landed when he landed, he would be completely dead. You know, um, he came out without a broken bone, no internal bleeding, only just a road rash. In a few days after he came home from the hospital, he gave his life to Jesus with me in the living room. Two years after I prayed. So my last journal entry <laughs> was him, about him giving his life to Christ. And if there's one thing that I would say to younger me right now, I would tell her to hang on, hold on, don't lose hope. It might not make sense right now, and it might not be easy for you, but one day it's all going to make sense and purpose will be made from your pain. The Lord will use it in mighty, mighty ways. Just trust and lean on Him. He is the Father that you never had. You are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God, and He's created you right here for a purpose such as this. And if the Lord can save me, he can save anybody. My name is Rima Angelique, and this is my story.